Hi, this is Miss Slitton, and this is my wonderful period two honors biology class. Say hi. Hi. And we're going to do a quick review of the earlier part of this chapter, chapter 22. So we know how do we get from here to here? That was our question. And we talked about that there are millions of sperm. They're all trying to get into the egg. Um, the first one that gets there that's able to digest the jelly coat. Does anybody remember what the jelly coat's name is? Zone. Zona pellucida. What's the little beanie on the sperm cap? Acrosome. Acrosome. So you use the acrosome to digest the zona pellucida. The sperm and the egg nucleus join, and then they form a diploid zygote. We went through that last class period. Then we said on the early stages, um, of development. Right after the sperm fertilizes the egg, it does a lot of really quick um, um, cell cycles. And remember, the cell cycle consists of I and M, right? I stands for what? Interphase. There are three parts to interphase. What are they? S1, G, G, N, S, and S, and G2. I can't Okay, what happens during G1? Yeah, it gets bigger, more organelles. S, what happens? Uh, DNA, DNA, is DNA is replicated. And G2, you make a bunch proteins. of proteins. All right. Then you go through mitosis and? No, mitosis and cytokinesis. Dial it in, dial it in. Focus your little bio vibes. Okay. Now, in the, right after the sperm fertilizes the egg, they're going through the complete cycle. But G1, they're not giving time for G1 of interphase. So what happens during G1 of interphase? The cell grows. So the cells aren't growing. You're replicating the DNA. You're still doing cytokinesis. You're doing the rest of that. And so they refer to that time where there's a lot of mitosis, but all the DNA is fine, still going through the S stage, as cleavage. Remember we said cleavage, cleavage, cleavage. And then you form um, a solid what? ball of cells called a marula, okay? A marula is a solid ball of cells. Then it pumps in salt. Who follows that salt? Water. Water. And then as it kind of blows it up like a, a, a water balloon, that's the word I'm looking for, and it forms a blastula. And a blastula is a what? Hollow ball of cells. And the cavity inside the blastula is called the blastocele. So it might help you. Let's do this from the beginning. Here comes Mr. Happy Sperm. What's he wearing on his head? Acrosome. And it contains enzymes. And it helps it penetrate the egg. And it forms a diploid zygote. Cleavage, cleavage, cleavage. And you form a solid ball of cells called a marula. Then we pump in salt. Who follows? Water. And we form a blastula. And a blastula is a hollow ball of cells. And that happens on day five. And the cavity inside is called, this is a blastula, right? It's called a blastocele. And if you go like this, maybe you'll think, seal, like I'm seeing it back, blast a seal. Good. Now you have a complex series of movements um, where you form a gastrula. You have an infolding and you think about letting the gas out of this, okay? And now we're a gastrula and a gastrula is a layered what? Layered ball of cells. And at first you have two layers, but eventually you have three. What is the outermost layer called? Ectoderm. What's the innermost? Endoderm. And the middle layer? Mesoderm. Good. And at that stage, you have a layered ball of cells, and your blastocele, it's gone bye-bye, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a new cavity inside, and the new cavity is called the archentron. And the opening, we remember that because we have an arch, and the opening to the archentron is called a blastopore. That's the tricky part right there, right? Because you're not a blastula. You don't have a blastocele at this point. We've moved past that stage. But the opening is called the blastopore. blastopore. And for you and I, the blastopore becomes our but anus. Yes. Not our butt, but our anus. Okay? Now, for other organisms, it might become their mouth. mouth. Okay? So we can see that here. We can see the archentron, and the opening right here is called the, the blastopore. 
Now, in humans, I've shown you how you form a gastrula in this lancelet, in this simple little fish. But in humans, the inner cell mass located inside the blastocyst actually goes through the next two stages. Now, we know levels of organization. How does it go? Atom, molecule, organelle, cell, tissue, organ, organ system, organism. Okay, stop right there. Look at your note, okay? On early stages of animal development, and we're on the what, okay? What's the number one? Underneath. The what? What's cellular. the first one? Cellular. cellular stages of development. And underneath that, we have marula and what? Blastula. Then we move on to the tissue. tissue. And here we have what, what stage? The gastrula. Okay, then number three is the organ. Just like before, cell, tissue, organ. We develop in that level of organization. The organ stage that we're going to be talking about is the number the nerula. Now, I don't know, did I give you all the notes for what the ecto, meso, and endoderm would be? Okay. I want to show you one other thing real quick. This stage right here where you're a gastrula, this is highly dependent on how much yolk you have. Okay? So the lancelet, that clear little fish that I was showing you from the beginning has very little yolk. So they can do what's called morphogenesis, where you move around in order to form structure. Super easy. They just like the red rubber playground ball. Let the gas out, it folds in, and you have a layered ball of cells. An organism with an intermediate amount of yolk would be a frog. And for a frog to form that gastrula stage, it can't just fold in like this. It literally has to grow up and around the yolk in order to get a layered ball of cells. And then an example of something that has the most yolk of all is a chicken. Now you know, have I had the chicken egg discussion with you? What? Okay, so you know when you crack an egg open and you look at the yolk, the yolk is not the chicken. The yolk is the food source for the baby chicken. What you wanna do is when you crack an egg open, take a look at it, and sitting on top of the yolk is a tiny little white disc. That's the actual egg. It's a little gamete. It's a tiny little white disc that sits on top of the yolk. Now, when you scramble eggs together like this, and you know that white slimy part that doesn't really get you know, in your scrambliness, it's, you can still kind of see it a little bit? That is not the, the, the egg. Those are little suspensory structures, so when the chick is developing, he's held up in the middle of the egg. He doesn't sink to the bottom, and they can the hen can rotate the egg, and you can still um, stay there in the middle. So that's different. Next time you crack open an egg, look on the yellow yolk, and you'll see a tiny little white disc. That's the actual egg. That's the gamete. Now, the eggs you eat, most of you, you buy them at the grocery store, they are unfertilized eggs, which means the female hen lays her, makes the egg, and then it passes through her reproductive tract and it puts on that shell onto the egg, puts the shell on, and then she lays the egg. Fertilized eggs would be if you had a rooster around, so they were having sex, and then they have sex, and she has a fertilized egg, and then as it passes through her reproductive tract, it puts the shell on, but now it's putting a shell around a diploid zygote. Yours is still haploid, that little disc. I will tell you from experience, having spent time growing up on a ranch, it is terrible when your father is going to make eggs in the morning and cracks an egg that somebody else missed over a few days, and they crack it, and this little baby-like chick thing is like, falls into the hot frying pan and goes, oh. you know, it's not really developed oh. yet. And that's the day you go, oh, how cereal, okay? <laughs> um, so, but all the eggs you eat are, are all unfertile. <coughs> it's, su it's super, it's like bloody, it's really, really oh, nice. Jesus. I know. <laughs> Thank you. So, but now you know about eggs. So, my point being here, okay? When you go to do make a gastrula in a chicken, it can't cleave through all that yolk. It's food source. It's like a little disc that sits on top. And that's what goes through all of those stages. Now, 
Once you have your full three layers, you have your ectoderm, your endoderm, and your mesoderm in the middle, we're what's called coelomated organisms, so we have a pocket in the middle of our mesoderm, this open pocket. And this is where your organs, like your heart, sit in this pocket. If I took a knife and just cut you open right here and opened you up, I'd be looking at all the organs sitting in your coelom, which is in the middle of your mesoderm. Your heart is here. Your kidneys would be in here. Okay. Now, you already know, what's the ectoderm going to be? The outermost layer is going to be your what? Skin. And then what do we use on the outside of our body to perceive and respond? The and the nervous system, right? So this is skin and nervous system. Now, this innermost layer here, this yellow right here, if I were to take a um, tube, and I said, I want you to open your mouth, and I took a hose, and I jammed it down his mouth, okay? And I went down his mouth, and I'm in his esophagus, and now I'm in his stomach, his small intestines, I keep going, his large intestines, I poke it out his anus. I could take that tube and go do 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 like this. I could just grab it. Okay? Because you, each one of us, has a tube that just runs down the center of our body. That tube is what's yellow right there. That is your endoderm, makes that tube. Okay? Now there's two systems. I, I chose to go down his digestive system, but where else could I go down? Respiratory. respiratory system. So that's how you remember that tube, and the opening to our tube is our mouth. The exit to that tube is our what? Anus. Where did our anus come from? The blastopore. Perfect. Okay. So this tube right here will be one of, it's our gut tube, but it could be one of two systems. What two systems could it be? Respiratory, Respiratory and digestive. And anything associated with those. For instance, the pancreas is part of digestion, so it would come from the endoderm. The liver is part of digestion, so it would too come from the endoderm. If you are not skin and nervous system, which would be from the epidermis or ectoderm, from the endoderm, digestive and respiratory, from the mesoderm in the middle, that's where everything else comes from. Muscle, bone, your reproductive system, your excretory system, um, your cardiovascular system all comes from the mesoderm region. Not it. Not it. <laughs> so whoever is not it, you go first. I'll bring these out and you explain what comes from it and help them to understand why that comes from it. Go. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Esoderm is like It's where all your organs are. Okay. Now teaching you the next part, okay? Um, what color is the ectoderm in this picture? Blue. Blue, okay. Do you see in there where it says neural tube? Yes. Okay, neural tube, what, comes, what system comes to mind? Nervous, brain. Nervous, Nervous system and brain, good, okay? That is, the neural tube is your spinal cord, okay? Now, it makes sense that your spinal cord would be blue in this picture because you know your nervous system comes from your ectoderm, good. Right below the spinal cord, you see that solid like dot, it runs the whole length of your body. Okay, do you see where it says notochord? I, I'm kind of covering it up a little bit. Yes. Ink. Yeah. Okay. Red ball, red ball. Makes me think of emoji speak, sorry. So you're on the endoderm, okay? Um, and the endoderm is yellow, right above it is the notochord, that's in pink right there. Okay, that notochord, um, the notochord induces the ectoderm above it to go like this and fold in to form a neural tube. Okay, no notochord, no neuroturf, no, no, um, uh, no, <laughs> 
No notochord, no neural tube above it. They have done experiments on salamanders where they've taken a salamander embryo and taken an additional notochord from a different salamander and put it in the tissue right there in the mesoderm and they have got it to develop two spinal cords and two heads. Oh. So that is a process called induction where that tissue determines the fate of a neighboring tissue. Okay, that's how this tissue controls that tissue. It's like extreme peer pressure. Okay, no notochord, no neural tube. And when you start to form this neural tube, that process is the neurula. So following gastrula is neurula. And here we're using the frog as the example. And let me make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so here we can see this neural plate and the beginnings right here of the notochord. And if I come over here, still see the notochord, it's starting to fold in here to form what's called the neural groove. And then here we can see it a little bit more and then complete right here, that's your neural tube. And that's called induction when one tissue influences another tissue's development. So going to your notes, did we do the notes on the layers or do I need to give that to you? Number two, the tissue stage of development? Yeah, we got them? <coughs> okay, so did we do B or Kentron? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, and so are we at three? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so organ stage of development, the neurula. When the nervous system forms from, what layer does it form from? Ectoderm. Good, from the ectoderm. You need PTC paper, right? Okay. Sorry. I said I would bring some over. Three A. When nervous system forms from ectoderm, you have the nervous system is induced. And do I have that bold and big? Okay, so that's going to come up later as well. You want to know that word. When the nervous system is induced to form by the notochord, the notochord will become the. And this part I did not teach you yet. So here's our neural tube. Here's the notochord for us because we are subphylum vertebrata which means we have a vertebral column, right? Mm -hmm. The notochord becomes, when, it when we mature, the notochord becomes the vertebral column that protects it. So for vertebrates, that's what this notochord will eventually be. So on B, the nervous system is induced to form by notochord. The notochord will become the vertebral column in vertebrates. Not in vertebrates, but in <laughs> vertebrates. And I don't think I had you watch this third video last time. If not, it'll be a good review. Okay, and when he goes back and reviews what you saw before, look for that folding, that line down the middle in the back. That's when you're forming the neurula. That's the spinal cord that's forming at that point. So here we're going to go through quickly the early stages of development again. 
and then we're going to get to this stage when the germ layers are set aside. The three germ layers, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. So here you'll see then that the inner cell mass gives rise to the entire adult animal, in this case a human. This same process would occur in a mouse as we'll see a bit later. If we now look at the embryo after the three germ layers have formed, That's right this there. video will highlight what comes from the Spinal blue germ cord layer of the right ectoderm. There. You'll see that it makes the nervous system, including the brain, and the skin. The middle part, the mesoderm, green here, gives rise to the muscle, including the kidneys, the heart, and the endoderm gives rise to the whole gut tube. There you see the lung, the liver, the intestine. And to give one more detailed of a example board, of this, right let's think about the development of the endoderm, and in this case, the formation of the pancreas. So there's the pancreatic bud, which comes out of the endodermal derivative. Very nice. Okay. All right. Um, good, 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 and good. All right. So now, series of questions. There we go. Maybe think through this with your bio buddy first if you want to. Remember, only your bio buddy should hear you. Cleavage, 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 solid ball of cells, marula. Don't even look up there. Look to me. So it goes cleavage, it goes marula, and then it goes what? Don't look. Look over at me. Blastula. When you pull the cavity inside of it, blastocele. Okay, then you form a gastula. New cavity is called archentron. The opening to that cavity is called blastospore. Good. And the number five is the no. Okay, good. Good job, Coachella. Thank you. concept okay this when we do our infolding let's go back here okay so when we form the gastrula what we're looking at right here that infolding right here the blastocele is going away our new cavity right here is called the archentron this right here represents the yellow 
the endoderm. The blue represents the ectoderm. Then, la then later, that middle layer that was pink in our pictures becomes the mesoderm. So this innermost layer in yellow is what we are looking at right here. This, whoa, okay, okay, no, bye -bye. So right here, this innermost layer of the endoderm, this was the archentron, and it becomes our gut. This is that tube that I sent all the way through them, okay? So the archentron, you might wanna add that to your notes because we had an epic fail on that one. So the archentron will become the gut tube. Archentron will become the gut tube. Good job, 19% of you. Good job, the double chin is real. Sweater weather, Starbucks. Good job, Tumblr, Bobo, the double chin is real. Okay, so most of you got that, 90% of you got it, that B, um, because it's not, you don't have a gut with the blastula. With the, with the blastula, we only have a blast seal. We don't get the gut until we're at the layered ball of cells, and that's called the gastrula. So that's why you would pick um, B. B is wrong. Some of you picked C. Gastrula, you do have three layers, ecto, meso, endo. And D, the neurula, is your nervous system, the forming of the spinal cord. Check your bio buddies clicker if they don't show. Shame. Shame. Here we go, here we go now. from the ectoderm and D, the lens, how can we correct that? The lens comes from where? Ecto. Ectoderm. The lens of your eye comes from the ectoderm. All right. Next. All right. So the section we just finished, okay, was the what. Now the next question you should be asking yourself is the how. Think about it. You were one cell and you become 
trillions of organized cells. I just told you the stages you went through, but why does it do it? How is it that you're made out of trillions of cells, but you come from the same genetic code? What come, what do, how do we get our genetic code interpreted? How do we know when we want to read our genes? We do what? Transcription. Transcription and then translation. translation into a protein. So why do some cells pay attention to one aspect of the genetic code and other cells pay attention to other aspects of the genetic code? That's the how part that we're talking about right now. And that's the process of differentiation or specialization. Okay, and here's how it goes. Here's the summary of the whole thing. The DNA is the same in every one of your cells, but what's different is in the cytoplasm. Now that should strike you as odd because you're one cell, so isn't all the cytoplasm the same, right? But there are differences in the way they are arranged and what ratio they are in your cell. Take a look at this picture and you can see here out, the purple is the nucleus. These are just representative proteins here in red and green. Now after the very first mitotic division, I have a top cell and a bottom cell. Which cell has more red in it? Bottom. The bottom. So this ratio of red to green in the bottom cell is different than the ratio of red to green in the top cell. That influences what genes are transcribed and translated into proteins, which starts them down different developmental pathways. They have done research on that, and we're going to talk about it from the point of view of a frog. Okay, touch the top of your head right here. What did I tell you happened right there? Sperm. Sperm. That is where your father's sperm penetrated your mother's egg. And that is a difference right here. If this is just, this right here is one cell. If this is one cell and this is where the sperm hits the egg, that's a difference. If the egg is here, this side has sperm, this side, no sperm. The other thing that you have that's a difference is the amount of yolk. There's the heavier part of that egg cell where the yolk is, and then the other side where there is no yolk. The part that is the heavier yolky part of this egg is called the vegetal pole, not vegetable, okay? But vegetal pole, and where there is no yolk, what do they call that? Animal, Animal pole. So let me break, break this out a little bit more with a picture, okay? So here, here is, let's say, your mother's egg. Okay. At the point um, when it's getting fertilized, it's going to have some areas, well, will you just keep with a frog, not your mama, okay? Frog is going to have areas that there is more yolk. So I can see there's a difference right here in this cell. Where the sperm penetrates the egg, right here, this side has sperm. This side has sperm, this side has what? No sperm, okay? Then when the second cleavage takes place here, this side has yolk, this side has no yolk. So let's identify what's going on in each quadrant. This side has what? Sperm. Sperm only, right? Does it have any yolk? No. No, what does this have? Yolk and sperm. Sperm and yolk. What does this side have? Sperm. No sperm. No, no, no yolk. What does this have? Yolk. yolk. Just yolk. Oh, I got you. All right. Slate, explain how is each quadrant different. And then I'm going to add to this picture. You may want to wait till I add in, and then you'll put that in your notes. Go ahead. All right, now, the part where the sperm penetrates the egg, this is always going to be the anterior or head region. And the opposite side is always going to be the, not anterior, but it starts with a P. Anterior. Posterior. Oh, oh posterior. OK, 
Okay, this right here is referred to as the vegetal pole. And what that's going to develop into is the ventral or front part of the animal. Do you remember what this pole is called right here? Animal, animal, animal pole. Animal. And this is always going to develop into the starts with a D. Dorsal, right, or the back. Okay. So these small differences in the cytoplasm, little, you know, little differences in the cytoplasm, once you start going through cleavage, 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 they start to make a difference because they're influencing what DNA is transcribed and what DNA is translated. Now this is when I would grab it as a picture if you're putting it in your notes because it has it all in. Yes? What if the sperm kind of treated like an on angle, like diagonal? Well, yeah, there's no, yeah, how do you do, this is a simplification of this, yeah, this full-on simplification. Okay, now, I'm going to go back to this one, because now you probably understand, you can see side of sperm, anterior, the other side, posterior, ventral, dorsal. Now, in a frog, they have something that's called a gray crescent, which looks kind of crescent-shaped if you're looking at the whole thing. We're seeing half of a crescent right here. Okay, wait, eyes up here for just a minute, okay? So that crescent on the frog, they're wondering what significance does it play? So they did some experiments, okay? And what they did is they took a normally developing frog and when it had become two cells, normally what happens is each gets a little bit of the gray crescent. They pulled those two cells apart. This would be one way to make identical twins, right? because they have the exact same DNA and you've ripped them apart. And they both developed normally. But when they forced the cleavage to happen at a different location, the not normal, the abnormal spot, when they forced it like this, where one got all the gray crescent and the other one got nothing, the one with the gray crescent obviously developed normally. The one over here with no gray crescent, it stayed a Blastula. And the reason is it's the gray crescent that induces it to become a gastrula. No gray crescent, it doesn't develop any farther. It's done. So that is a critical part in frog development is to have a piece of that gray crescent. Now I'm going to go back to twins. Early on, up to about eight cell, st eight cell stage for us, um, you will have full developmental potential. So you could go into a human embryo when it's like eight cells big and separate them all out and you could get octuplets that are identical and they would probably develop normally. But remember the vagina is not a clown car, okay? But what happens is what early on in development, if they end up getting cleaved and separated from each other, as long as it's early on, they will develop normally. But have you seen, like they've shown in the news recently, like conjoined twins where they're doing surgeries and they're sharing part of the nervous system or sharing, you know, the lower half of their body but the top halves are separate. Those type of things, there was not complete separation. So as a result, they're, you know, part of their bodies are shared. And sometimes you can separate them out and sometimes you can't. All right, so go to your notes on cellular differentiation. And I'm going to jump back to this first slide. Um, every cell contains the exact same DNA slash genetic material. Every cell contains the exact same DNA slash genetic material. And artotipotent, that's a good word to know. You might want to highlight it at first. They have full developmental potential. However, there are small differences in the small differences in the immediate environments small differences in the immediate environments, which activate or inactivate different, any guesses? Different, starts with a G. Genes. Genes. Which can cause cells to develop slightly differently. This is called differentiation. This is called differentiation. 
So sperm penetration, that will be what end where the sperm penetrates? Anterior end. On the poles, the vegetal pole is the area of yolk and it will become what region? Ventral. The ventral region. Whereas the animal pole will become the dorsal region. Perfect. The gray crescent in frogs, it must have this in order to develop normally to form a gastrula. Cleavage or cytokinesis will separate the ooplasmic female proteins differently, which will activate different genes. Will separate the ooplasmic female proteins differently, which will activate different genes, which will result in differentiation which will result in differentiation. What is that? Is a rat? Yeah, it's a little mouse what developing. Is, they're so cute. All right. All right. So could blue tell slate could blue tell slate what morphogenesis is? Read the definitions and then put it in your outline. Blue tell the form of the body parts. Okay, so basically it's like self-aware and the body. I don't want it. Okay, so it's pretty cool. Anytime that you're changing the shape or inducing, for instance, when you form a neurula, to get the nerve cord to form, the notochord has to induce that and starts moving around. Those are examples of morphogenesis. So on your definition, I already gave you that. Movement of cells that changes the shape and form of the body parts. And morphogens cause morphogenesis. Morphogens are just proteins. And basically you get one tissue to influence another tissue, which can then in turn influence another tissue, and in turn that influences another tissue, um, until you reach the end of that developmental stage. So induction, the term I need you to know, induction, which we referenced earlier. This is a long, longer definition, so alpha and beta come into play here. Induction, when one tissue influences the development of another, when one tissue influences the development of another, either by direct contact or the release of chemicals slash morphogen. When one tissue influences the development of another, either by direct contact, either by direct contact or the release of chemicals or morphogen. Or the release of chemicals or morphogen. All right, let me explain this picture because it's a little complicated when you look at it. So a morphogen, what did I tell you a morphogen could be? Or made out of, don't eat in class. Proteins. What could it be? Proteins. Proteins. So this protein is affecting what DNA is, and I heard you say it earlier, what DNA gets transcribed and translated, which then makes another morphogen, which then influences what DNA gets transcribed and translated, which makes another morphogen, and so on and so on. So a good example, like I said, was the formation of your neural tube. It's a good induction example. And dark shirted bio, buddy, go ahead and explain this. Go ahead. It's very simple. You've already learned it. Just go ahead. Okay, so let me jump in here. So this is your, there are two classic examples you want to know. Notochord inducing the epidermis above to fold in and form that neural tube. And here's another picture, same idea you can see here. 
um, from above and it's folding in to form that mural tube. Another classic example is the eye. Now, where did I tell you your lens came from? Ectoderm. Ectoderm. The tissue below it induces your lens to fold in and form the lens of the eye. Then once the lens is there, it gets the tissue to develop into your optic cup, which has your rods and your cones and everything to see. And they have done um, experiments where they have moved um, these optic vesicles, the tissue that induces the lens above it, onto frogs' legs. So they've gotten eyes to develop down oh. the length of a leg of a frog. Now, can those eyes all work? No, because you don't have all the neurons that are going down to them, but they do develop an eye. And that's the thing about induction. This is some serious peer pressure, okay? And it tells the tissue above it, you will form an eye. And they're like, okay. And so then an eye gets formed. And that would be another example of that, okay? Here are some examples of these homeotic genes that have formed morphogens where they have placed in insects, there are things called imaginal discs, and they know what those imaginal discs are going to be, so they'll take them from one animal and place them in the developing embryo, and so they did this in order to make this fly have two sets of wings, or they'll make legs coming out of the top instead of antennas by just moving these little discs and influences that kind of development to happen, okay? All right, um, so on your notes on morphogens, I gave you the definition of induction below at little letter I. It seems to activate certain genes. Seems to activate certain genes and examples. Notochord induces brain development. Optic vesicles induce formation of the lens. Optic vesicles induce formation of the lens. Now, also another part of development is not only making more cells and morphogenesis, those moving around, but for you to develop normally, death has to happen along the way too. For instance, I told you your hands would be paddles, but what happens right here to, to make fingers? Apoptosis. apoptosis. So apoptosis is normal for development as well. Here to make our fingers, these for organ sculpting, so if we're gonna make an organ, we have to kill off some to give it that shape that it has. Just like if you were gonna make a vase or something in art, you have to cut off some of that clay and, and get rid of it. That's what's happening here. This is how the tail comes off the frog, is that tissue dies. And if it doesn't, then these are when you have that unfinished, <laughs> unfinished, um, differentiation you don't sculpt it exactly right now they should cut that exactly okay so that sometimes happens where they'll go and cut it and sometimes they don't cut it I would have it Okay, yeah. Yeah, usually they can't. Usually, yeah, they would just have to perform surgery. I would want the surgery. Not, people who have this on their toes, though, sometimes, you know, their parents don't say, oh, they need to, you know, they don't think about the rest of their life, that kid, like when he's in middle school, you know, that they're going to call him floppy or whatever. Floppy. Oh, <laughs> <Bad one>. So, <laughs> poor toe. Apoptosis, I already gave you the definition of that, and let's do a couple questions. You, I gave you a slide on this, and I don't think I ever said the word. I don't think I ever told you the word. This is a harder question, because I, I actually, I minimized your notes. So you may not get this. You may not get this. <laughs> here, look, 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 I'll go back. I forgot that I put this in here. Let me go back to here. Look at these. Yeah, the, yeah there it is. Oh. Oh. Oh, if you want to add that in your notes, go ahead. So you can this. That was Trixie. I'm just kidding. Okay, so those are called homeotic genes. Okay, they're not called morphogen genes or induction genes, though that's what it's about. 
They're called homeotic genes. So you can add that in your notes. So you have that as a reference. Okay, where it says morphogens, proteins, morphogens in a gradient. Why don't you add a little dash there and you could say from homeotic genes. From homeotic genes. So after proteins or morphogens in a gradient, put from homeotic genes. Okay, here you go. Oh, or you know what? I found a better place. Note takers, go to B little I, seem to activate certain genes. Do you see that? Add it there, homeotic genes. <laughs> Would be the best part. Okay, guys, if you're feeling comfortable with this, this is that you are done with the hardest part of this chapter. Okay, hardest part is done. Here we go. Five. So I want to help you on reading questions. So this is saying the ability of one tissue, the ability to affect another tissue. One tissue is influencing another tissue. What do you call that, that ability? One tissue to influence another? Good, most of you got that, induction. Okay, when one tissue influences another, it's called induction. Um, could blue, everybody's blue right now, tell Slate what the definition of morphogenesis is? Because 19% of you picked that. Go look at your definition of morphogenesis. Yes. <laughs> so if I asked you about the changes, if I asked you about the changes in body parts, then the answer would have been what? Morphogenesis. But the ability for one tissue to influence another, that is through induction. What changes as a result of, of that is called morphogenesis. And this is a map. Morphogenesis, the change in body parts, yes, it's going to be influenced by morphogens in a gradient. Yes, it, induction is involved where one tissue influences another. This is the definition of morphogenesis and it's genes that code for the morphogens. So all four of those are involved. Okay, check with your bio buddy and see if they are Shadowlands or Sunshine so far. Shadowlands or Sunshine. And then one more. This I can hear. Okay, do you want to change it for me? Yeah. Is this a man or a map? Map. Map. Yes, but even more, is it a man? Are multiple answers necessary? Yeah. Yes. 
I said multiple answers are possible, but are multiple answers necessary? Yes, they are. Okay, 86% of you got it. That's good. Yeah, so it is necessary for normal development. Hi, right. Oh, wait. Oh, spinning wheel of death. Necessary for development. And I, nervous system phalanges, are formed that way. And it is called apoptosis. Okay? Not it. Got it. Tell them two things, Pastor Clay, that you have learned so far today. Two things you have learned so far today. And we're going to shut this down and we'll do part two.